Hi, my name is Jolene Kirui. I'm a senior cloud security advocate in Microsoft. And today I'll be taking you through the art of defensive programming. So a little bit of stats here. Uh, we are seeing that around 68% of companies say that their CEOs demand DevOps and security teams not to do anything that slows down the business. So this leads to around 52% of companies sacrificing um, cybersecurity for speed, 57% of ops team pushing back on security best practices, 44% of developers are actually not trained on code coding securely. And this also comes from a result of having, um, adopting um, a lot of open source um, code as well, because you're seeing 80 to 90% of the code in new application comes from open source. And if you don't take into consideration the amount of uh, security vulnerabilities that is in the open source um, software that we are using, then we are introducing security vulnerabilities into our uh, coding environment. So um, a little bit of stuff as well there, uh, we are seeing that we have around 570 times more developers and security researchers. In that case, it's almost impossible to have a one-to-one -on -one, one -one equivalent in terms of pushing and evaluating security, all the, all the code that's actually being built by developers. That's why it's quite important for us to go in and do a lot of automation as well. So other sources of security vulnerabilities um, that we are seeing are um, unchecked dependencies. Um, and then we have also employee errors. This includes um, exposed access tokens and safe code patterns. Uh, one thing that I have learned from this journey as well is that in most cases, developers actually push code and they know that they're actually pushing vulnerable code. Um, in most cases, they already know that, they, that there's a vulnerability in their code. Uh, as we had earlier, we have 570 times more developers than security researchers. And damage is usually exponentially greater when it is found in production than in um, development, during the development life cycle. So uh, why do we have to shift security left? So uh, the importance of shifting security left um, is because to safeguard the developer cloud against um, new threat types, the answer is always to shift security left and to leverage um, cloud native security as well. So um, shifting left helps enterprises find and remediate vulnerabilities earlier and across the development life cycle. In this case, enterprises um, that extend security to development reduce security incidents by 80%. And this is not just a reduction in events. There's also a financial component. It costs 60 times more to fix a security defect in production than in development. So blending security and development together within the development workflow remains a challenge for many enterprises. So while more enterprises are starting their transformations, there are still 62% of enterprises that have yet to integrate security into the development phase. So let's dive into how security fits into the development life cycle. So each stage of the development life cycle has unique security components that when used together help prevent threats at all critical junctions. So for the pre-commit stage, uh, it's important to start with a focus on threat modeling and understanding the threat landscape to grasp the overall risk of what you are looking to bring to execution in code. So in the thought of having a defensive programming, the first com component is usually, that's very important is, especially during the pre-commit, is doing threat modeling. It's trying to evaluate and see, okay, what threat vectors can be used by a hacker to compromise your system during the design stage. So at least you can scope out and say, okay, so these are the areas, these are the endpoints that would be public facing. And these are the threats that would be faced um, in this API that's actually uh, publicly um, exposed. So, and then you can be able to now think of ways of defending against uh, the, those um, threat vectors from being exploited. So you need to employ a range of IDE security plugins as well and uh, pre-commit hooks to make sure that the code you're generating adheres to security standards. 
So during the pre-commit stage, you also have to make sure that you have secure coding standards in place for your organization to, um, that your developers are adhering to. So uh, I'll give a brief about um, some of the secure coding standards that should be adhered to in, in a defensive programming environment. On basis, um, these 10 would be uh, equated for an environment for any developer where we are always talking about um, input validation. Make sure that you never trust what a user is inputting. That's why we're looking at um, checking the data length, uh, validating the character sets, uh, using restrictions as well. Another uh, security coding standard that we make have to make sure that we are checking is managing authentication and passwords. Um, we are making sure that at least you're using um, TLS client authentication, you're using the correct authentication and authorizations as well, and you're not transmitting passwords um, in the clear. You're making sure that you're pass transmitting passwords securely. So this is a key concept that should be followed by all developers in terms of managing authentication and passwords. And for passwords, make sure that you're using a secure um, vault, like um, Azure Key Vault, um, to store your um, credentials as well. So a third uh, security best practice that you can follow is to make sure that you're always sanitizing your data first. And then you send that input to other systems as well. So you can use um, a whitelist to allow uh, a particular data to be it's, it's actually allowed or a blacklist, or you can use um, escape inputs to keep things um, safe as well. Um, another concept that you should follow for secure coding is adopting the principle of least privilege. If someone doesn't have should not have access to something, they should not only have access to what they are required to have. So this is where uh, we need to validate permissions as much as possible. Another concept for secure coding that we have to follow uh, in the art of defensive programming is to make sure that you have an architecture in place where you have to make sure that um, you're using um, secure architecture. We have several, um, like the OWASP secure architecture practice that are available for you to view. Um, so you need to make sure that for every organization you have a secure architecture um, and design that you need, that all developers follow. Um, the sixth that I would say is um, to deny access by default for all systems. Uh, this is what we're talking about, zero trust, um, in, in almost all levels of, of your infrastructure as well. And uh, we also have to make sure that we are keeping, uh, that you have very many layers of defense. So this is where we're talking about um, adding several layers of protecting your application, protecting your data, protecting your APIs, protecting your containers, making it very hard for hackers to actually compromise your system in terms of also natural segregation, in terms of the kind of environment that you are building, that the developers are building is also secure. Another uh, concept for secure coding that we have to follow is make sure that um, you secure the kind of environment and working communication that you have. So you have to make sure that uh, you're using strong um, encryption, uh, you protect your databases as well. You make sure that you sign your code before releasing it. And another one that we have to follow is to check the quality of your code and follow coding standards. We have to make sure that you have a good peer review of your code um, uh, before um, pushing that code to your com before you commit the code as well. So. Um, this is quite an important com concept in terms of defensive programming, whereby you taking into account um, threat modeling, um, ID security plugin, pre-commit hooks, security um, coding standards, uh, peer review as well. Um, so for today, we are actually going to go through a way of you as a developer um, integrating CodeQL as an IDE security plugin and identifying security vulnerabilities on the go. Another key concept that we follow is um, running static and dynamic analysis. So another aspect of securing the developer workflow is through uh, assessing our own created code. So one of the ways to check our code is with static and dynamic analysis. 
So it is best to use a combination of these techniques to make sure that the findings are prioritized in the right way. So static analysis examines the code base and finds potential vulnerabilities that may be present in the code being created. And dynamic analysis reviews running code and runs simulated attacks on the code base itself. So that's why we look, talk about SAS as well as, as DAST. And I'm sure we, we have several other sessions that are covering on SAS and DAST. But for today, uh, our main area of focus will be on code scanning using CodeQL. CodeQL allows your team to treat code as data, and it enables them to create their own queries in addition to the standard community-powered queries. Uh, for today, uh, we are going to see how we can be able to use the community-powered security queries on your code to find uh, security vulnerabilities when you are using your IDE. We'll dive right into the demo. So I will practically show you how to use CodeQL um, on your IDE to identify security vulnerabilities um, using the community build queries um, for security, which I will just show you here. So you can see uh, we have um, all these security CWEs um, and they're named according to the particular IDs. So you can go in and query any of these available queries against you, um, your code base um, to see if it's actually vulnerable. So um, CodeQL is an open source uh, static application security tool. Um, and it allows users to also write queries to find bugs, not only for security vulnerabilities, but also any kind of bug um, from their source code. So, um, how do you get started with um, CodeQL? So uh, when you are in your IDE, you can go to your extensions, go to your marketplace um, extensions and search for CodeQL and um, make sure that you install the plugin. In my case, um, it's already installed, but it's as simple as that. Um, going into the uh, extensions uh, marketplace and making sure that you have um, the extension installed. And then um, the thing with, uh, with CodeQL, um, it analyzes your code in terms of um, a database. So you need to, um, to generate a database for your code. So um, the way I usually do it um, is through, um, since I'm using Windows operating system here, um, you can go to GitHub um, slash CodeQL, and then there is a folder that is uh, zipped for CodeQL, which you can um, uh, extract for your Windows, uh, for your Linux, for your, for your Mac OS as well. And um, once you extract them, you can be able to uh, add them to path and make sure that you are able to run um, CodeQL CLI from your from your machine. So once you're able to run CodeQL CLI, um, you just um, clone the, the code that um, you want to, um, to review or to research on. Um, it, might, it may be from GitHub as well. And then what you do, you build a database um, for that particular um, project. So you run a code um, like CodeQL database create and then you give it a database name and you specify the language of that particular uh, project that you're using. So in this example, if we, we are using Java, uh, so it will be CodeQL database create, uh, uh, then you give it like webgoat uh, language Java. So it will take a bit of time just for it to build the database. Uh, and then um, once it it uh, once it creates a Java uh, a compressed file um, like its database, what you do, you come back to your Visual Studio. Um, there will be this extension um, for CodeQL. You come there, and then you add a database. You add the database here. So I had already added um, this particular database. Um, 
we've, we've already mentioned before that um, CodeQL will analyze your code in terms of database. So um, if you're running like a uh, um, marketing application um, that's based on Java, so what CodeQL will do, it will, uh, it will wrap, up, uh, wrap that up and um, present it in terms of a database. So you add it here under databases and and then um, what you do because you want to use the community built queries um, you go to github slash codeql um, repo and then you use that um, code already um, you, you you clone that um, into your visual studio and then you can be able to run all those um, queries that are already built um, using uh, from the community against your code remember in this case your code is in quote quotes uh, in quotes uh, database so in this particular instance uh, what i wanted to run um, against my code was to check for um, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities so so what happens is um Okay, I'll give you, um, so I had this open already. So um, you will find that um, you have this particular uh, file, um, this particular query um, for um, SQL um, injection that's, um, that's already available, but also have all these other queries that check for um, particular common weakness enumeration. So, um, for today, we will cover CWE, CWE 079. So we want to see if our code is actually vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So um, it's as easy as going into um, that folder and checking for the query language for XSS. So what you do, you go to XSS um, query language, and then you right click and run it, uh, run the queries in the selected files. So it will take some bit of time um, just to crawl through all your lines of code to check for this particular cross-site scripting um, vulnerability. And then what it does, um, once it's finished, this is what it will give. It will give you um, all the lines that are actually vulnerable so let's run that once again. So right click and say um, CodeQL run queries. So you'll give it a few minutes just for it to crawl through and um, see which particular lines of code is actually vulnerable. So remember, um, you don't have to only use this um, security um, queries. Uh, you can build your own as well. So you might be, um, coding and then you notice that oh, um, I actually did something wrong. And then you want to see, okay, um, what other code have I pushed that actually has this running or has this particular vulnerability? So as you can see here, um, there will be a pop-up um, on the bottom right, um, just checking for uh, running the queries. So after a few minutes, um, the XSS um, query will have run through your whole code and given you um, the lines of code that are actually vulnerable. So as you can see here, um, it tells you that cross-site scripting vulnerability due to a user-provided value. Uh, so when you go to that particular line, um, it will tell you that um, you need to change this. So um, as you can see, it's, it's very important to make sure that you're using um, IDE security plugins uh, whenever you're coding to make sure you identify the security vulnerabilities as early on as possible, even before you commit your code. And as well as having um, secure um, coding standards, 
set in place. Uh, I've seen uh, events whereby you only have like a checklist only for the developers like um, to follow, um, like for four lists, uh, four, four lists to do or to adhere to whenever they're coding. But it's also important to have regular security training for the developers, as well as having security uh, champions uh, among the developers um, who will advocate for the others to take security um, seriously, and as well as being quite intentional about training them every so often. Um, in the past, what I've done is at least once a month, um, you have like an all hands for developers to make sure that um, they are up to date with um, security best practices. And every so often uh, for security champions, at least you have them on a more regular basis as well. Um, so maybe some um, call to action as well. Um, you can go to aka.ms uh, slash DevSecOps solution and uh, go to know um, some of the solutions that are available on Azure as well as GitHub for your complete end-to-end -end DevSecOps um, journey. And we have very many tools that are available, including Microsoft Defender for DevOps, uh, also um, some tools available for container security as well. In terms of infrastructure as code and um, a lot is available there as well. So if you want to learn around um, CodeQL, um, you can go to codeql.github.com uh, there are very many docs that are available. Uh, you can see ways of um, integrating or um, installing the CodeQL extension by yourself and how you can go about and um, querying the community security queries against your code to make sure that uh, to find out if you're actually vulnerable. So um, on top of using um, CodeQL on your IDE, you can also use it as part of GitHub Advanced Security um, in GitHub. So um, this is available as well for both uh, public and private repos. Um, so if you have your public repo, you can go to the security tab and make sure that you have um, security scanning enabled uh, and as well as Defender Bot um, enabled, dependency scanning enabled. So GitHub Advanced Security will cover your code scanning and as well as your credential scanning and as well as your dependency scanning. Uh, and it will still give you, uh, it will still use CodeQL um, to scan for your um, code security vulnerabilities. That's it for the day. Uh, you can catch me on our Twitter at uh, Jolene underscore Kiruri. In case you have any questions, you can uh, link with me on LinkedIn as well using Jolene Kiruri, and I'm very happy to answer um, all your questions. Thank you very much.